This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Myconid. There have been a lot of weird monsters in Dungeons and Dragons through the years. A lot of really weird monsters. Like, really weird. Once, for example, there was a tree stump that had a bunny on it that was actually a burrowing tentacle monster. Seriously, the bunny was a growth that came out of the stump monster's head that was specifically designed to make it look like a perfectly safe tree stump and to attract adventurers. Presumably an adventurer would see this bunny sitting on the stump and think, Oh, what a cute little pink bunny rabbit. <coughs> Just what I always wanted, my own little bunny rabbit. I will name him George, and I will hug him and pet him and squeeze him. And then tentacles would come out of the ground, and a toothy maw opens in the stump, and a few minutes later, the player is erasing the name on his character sheet and making up a new one. Because that's what players did in those days. Now, some of these bizarre creatures have been recognized as pretty silly ideas, and they've gradually vanished from official D&D product releases. Monsters like the Stump Beast, or the Duck Bunny, or the Flail Snail, which was basically a giant snail with six tentacles instead of eye stalks, each of which ended in a bony, spiky ball. Like a flail. Get it? But as silly and as weird as they were, some of the old, strange monsters have endured, even thrived. Monsters like the Owlbear and the Umber Hulk. They've become icons of the D&D franchise. And then there are the creatures that didn't get forgotten, but didn't thrive as icons either. They keep showing up in D&D edition after edition, usually in supplemental material after the major core releases. Like the Myconid. Way back in 1980, David Cook wrote the first of a series of four modules known as the Slave Lords series. Module A1, Slave Pits of the Undercity, was set in the world of Greyhawk and introduced a group of villains known as the Slave Lords. The Slave Lords are seafaring raiders and kidnappers who have been raiding settlements along the wild coast and sell their captives into slavery. The heroes are hired by local authorities to break up the slave ring and track the slavers to their lair in the sewers below the city of Pomarge. There, they fight the slavers and rescue the slaves. And... Inexplicably, they also fight a whole bunch of giant insect monsters. This module was also historically significant as the cover art by Jeff D. may have been the origin of the fight over whether female dwarves have beards. Yes, that was seriously a fight back in the day. And the cover depicted a red-headed female dwarf warrior with a fiery beard. The fourth module in the series, A4, In the Dungeons of the Slave Lords by Lawrence Schick, ends the series. Following on from the third module, the heroes begin as captives of the surviving slave lords. They're trapped in the caves beneath a volcanic island and must escape before earthquakes and eruptions destroy it. And they must kill the escaping slave lords in the process. In one section of the caves, they meet a group of bloated and spongy humanoid mushrooms called myconids. And the Myconids seem really weird. But as you'll soon learn, in the grand scheme of things, they aren't actually as weird as they seem. Now, back in those days, monsters were very well detailed, so Module A4 goes into a lot of detail about the Myconids and their society. We discover that the Myconids are intelligent and social, but incapable of speech. Instead, they are telepathic. Well, partially. See, the Myconids can spew forth clouds of spores, and those spores have amazing powers. The simplest power is communication. Distress spores, as they were called, allowed the Myconids to tell other Myconids they were in trouble. Rapport spores allowed the Myconids to communicate telepathically with each other and with other creatures. Pacifier and Hallucinator spores allowed them to affect the minds of other creatures, making them calm and peaceful, or subjecting them to bizarre hallucinations. Reproduction spores gave birth to new myconids. And finally, animator spores could be issued forth by the most powerful myconids, the myconid kings. If they coated the corpse of a humanoid or animal, a purple slimy fungus would grow and feed on the corpse. It would also animate the rotting corpse, turning it into a fungal zombie. Crazy, right? Except it's not crazy for the reasons you think. Let's do some fact checking. Now, the name Myconid comes from a Greek root, 
Perhaps you've heard the word mycology, for example. That means the study of mushrooms and fungus. The word actually comes from the Greek word mykes, which means fungus. But mykes actually comes from an even earlier root from which we get the word mucus. It means slimy and slippery. The point is, myconid means fungus person. So that checks out. But what actually is a fungus? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to biology. On Earth, all living things are generally broken down into five or six categories, depending on which country you live in. You've got your animals, your plants, your protozoans, and various classifications of bacteria. And you've got fungus. Now, you're probably familiar with fungi, the plural of fungus. You've probably seen food like bread turn green and fuzzy. That green fuzzy stuff, that mold, that's a fungus. And perhaps you've eaten stuffed mushroom caps or had mushroom soup. Mushrooms are also fungus. And if you like bread and cake and beer, you're also familiar with the word fungi because yeast, the stuff that makes bread rise and makes beer alcoholic, is a fungus. What makes a fungus a fungus? Well, once upon a time, fungi weren't fungi at all. They were considered plants. See, fungi seem very plant-like. Lots of them grow in soil. They can't move, some of them flower, and some release clouds of a pollen-like powder, which we now call spores. But as biology became more advanced, we discovered a few qualities that told us we were dealing with something different. Unlike plants, for example, fungi cannot create their own food. Instead, they must draw food from their environment. Plants get chemical ingredients from their environment and use that to make their own nutrients. But bread mold, for example, is actually eating the bread it is living on. In that respect, bread mold is not very different from you or me. And yeast? Yeast consumes sugars, and as it digests the sugars, it poops out carbon dioxide gas and sometimes alcohol. Put yeast in bread dough, and the carbon dioxide creates bubbles inflating the dough. That's what makes bread so spongy and soft and fluffy. And with the right mix of ingredients, it can turn some of the sugar from the barley or other grain into delicious alcohol. So why not classify fungus as an animal? After all, there are animals that can't move. Coral, for example, is an animal. What's the difference? Well, if you dig down to the very small cellular level and look at individual fungus cells, you discover that they do have something in common with plants. Their cells are protected by hard outer walls. Those walls make the cells extremely durable. This, by the way, is why vegetables are so crunchy and hard to digest. The cells are tough and durable. What we call fiber or roughage, that's actually a plant defensive structure known as a cell wall. So fungus aren't really plants and aren't really animals. They are something in between. But that's not all. See, fungus don't have roots. In fact, the part of the fungi we would think of as roots are really the actual fungi itself, called the mycelium. The part we see above ground and think of as the fungi is really just the fruiting body of the underground fungus. The mycelium produces a unique feeding structure called hyphae, which are long threads composed of single cells, a bit like roots. But while roots are composed of long strings of individual cells and are part of the larger plant, hyphae are long, single-cell, tendril-like structures that are the plant itself. And when two hyphae intersect, they can produce a new fruiting body or mushroom, as they break down the material the fungus is feeding on. And speaking of feeding, fungi are also completely unlike both plants and animals in another way. They tend to lack the sort of complex internal anatomies that animals and plants rely on. Every cell has to be able to live on its own. Most large fungi, though there are exceptions, are like colonies of cells rather than complex anatomical systems. And that is why most fungi tend to grow along food surfaces and spread out. And that is what makes myconids kind of crazy. The idea of mobile, sentient mushroom people requires an anatomy that most fungi just can't pull off. But what's absolutely funny is that all the rest of the stuff, the spores, the telepathy, the hallucinations, the zombies, yeah, all that is totally normal. We kid you not. First of all, let's talk about spores and buds, the two primary ways that fungi reproduce. Now, fungal reproduction is actually remarkably complex. Most fungi utilize several different methods of reproduction, even within the same species. 
Imagine if humans could have sex and give birth to live babies, or lay eggs, or just split into two perfect copies of themselves. That's how weird and complicated fungi reproduction can get. But at their simplest, fungi primarily either spore or bud, and those are both very similar processes. A bud is a small baby fungus that grows off a parent fungus. A spore is a baby fungus that falls off its parent and drifts away in the air. Both buds and spores are basically perfect copies, clones, of the parent. And it's spores drifting through the air that lead to bread mold getting onto your bread. Spores of mold are everywhere. Now what's interesting is that some species of mushrooms have a particular problem when it comes to their spores. Because mushrooms live in moist, dark, sheltered areas close to the soil, there's generally no wind to spread their spores around. So they've evolved to increase the rate at which they release water into the air when they are sporing. That changes the air temperature directly above the mushroom and creates a little updraft to carry the spores upward into the wind. In 2013, experiments demonstrated that this little tiny wind could carry mushroom spores almost four inches up into the air. So fine. Spores as a general idea? Excellent. Spores for reproduction? Also excellent. But what about mushrooms changing moods and causing hallucinations? Well, you're probably not going to be surprised when we tell you that there is nothing weird about that. After all, who hasn't heard about magic mushrooms, a class of drugs known as hallucinogens? And that comes down to something called psilocybin. Psilocybin is a psychoactive compound. It has weird effects on the brain. It creates hallucinations. Hallucinations are sights and sounds and other sensations that are produced inside of the brain. They are distinct from delusions, which are ideas and beliefs that have no basis in reality. Basically, hallucinations are just sensations that don't come from the outside world, but instead are created by the parts of your brain that process sensory information. What's interesting, though, is how psilocybin actually produces hallucinations. In 2014, scientists at King's College in London hooked up 15 volunteers to MRI that were capable of monitoring their brain activity. Basically, it allowed the scientists to see what parts of the brain were active and when. This is a very common method of neurological research. But then, they fed the volunteers a dose of psilocybin mushrooms. And they discovered that the psilocybin wasn't producing weird random firings of brain bits, which was always assumed to be the cause of the hallucinations. Instead, it was causing parts of the brain that didn't normally work together to become synchronized. Basically, the different parts of the brain had become hyper-connected, and so signals were going between places that normally didn't have signals traveling between them. It was actually similar to a mental disorder known as synesthesia, where sensations get incorrectly linked together in the brain. People suffering from synesthesia might see colors when they hear music, or they might always smell chocolate when they see the number four. Similar things were happening in the brains of the volunteers. After the psilocybin wore off, the brain activity returned to normal. More interestingly, they also found that the psilocybin had a slowing effect on certain other areas of the brain. These included the thalamus, which is a structure in the middle of the brain that acts as a switchboard. The thalamus helps ensure brain signals travel between the right parts of the brain. Retarding the operation of the thalamus and other brain structures involved in information transfer and control may be the method by which psilocybin actually creates its hallucinatory effects. It's possible that the effects of psilocybin may actually be useful in treating depression, and patients treated with a single dose of psilocybin report a lasting feeling of happiness and satisfaction in some studies. But please, do not self-medicate. So, mushroom men inducing hallucinations and altering the moods of humanoids, making them more peaceful and relaxed? Also check. But telepathy? Well, why not? After all, plants are practically telepathic. We normally think of plants as passive things. They grow and live, sure, but that's about all they do. They aren't exactly active. They don't react to their environment. Heck, they barely even seem to be aware of their environment. But this is actually a misconception. The truth is, plants are aware of what's going on around them. For example, we know that plants exhibit phototropism. They grow and bend towards the light. Charles Darwin even did experiments in the 1860s to exhibit that the tips of growing plant stems were somehow aware of light. 
Now, we know that it isn't really sight. Instead, plants exude chemicals that inhibit growth, which are then destroyed by exposure to bright light. Thus, when the plant is pointed toward direct sunlight, the chemicals that slow the plant from growing are destroyed, and the plant grows in that direction. But there is growing research that suggests that plants might actually be aware of their environment in more direct ways. Recently, the magazine Scientific American discussed recent discoveries that indicate some plants might have primitive eye spots and can even respond to shapes and colors in their environment. For example, a South American vine called Boquilla trifoliata grows along the rainforest floor and climbs up host plants. That's not too unusual. But what is unusual is that the plant changes color to mimic the surface it's attached to. On the forest floor, among the leaf litter and dirt, the vine is a ruddy brown. But where it clings to another living plant, it is green to mimic the surface. And that's true even if it isn't touching the surface. Now several methods have been suggested for this mimicry, but with evidence that other plants may be able to see, it might be that Bochila trifoliata has some sort of eyes. Another method that it might use is one that is all too common among plants. And this is where the telepathy comes in, because plants are able to communicate with each other. You know the smell of freshly cut grass, for example? That is the smell of terrified plants screaming for help. See, when a blade of grass is damaged, it is usually because something is eating it, usually a bug, and it starts to emit this odor, which just happens to attract other insects. Insects that eat the sort of bugs that eat the grass. Tobacco plants are even more amazing. They are so sensitive to the saliva of their greatest enemy, the hornworm caterpillar, that when such a caterpillar drools on a tobacco plant, it panics. It begins to emit a chemical signal that attracts the big-eyed geochorus bug to eat the caterpillars. Plants can use similar chemical signals to communicate with each other. The humble Great Lakes sea rocket is a simple coastal weed. And, like all plants, it is designed to spread its roots and reach for the sun and to try to outcompete all other plants for water and sunlight. In fact, it is very good at aggressively spreading its roots to outcompete the other plants. Except when it's growing next to other sea rockets. When sea rockets are growing adjacent to each other, their roots grow in a much more constrained pattern so as to share ground nutrients. That's right, the plant can somehow recognize its neighbors, and it shares nutrients when it recognizes its brothers and sisters. But there's another example of plant communication we've known about for thousands of years. We just didn't know we knew it. And it has to do with how fruits ripen. Fruits are actually the sex organs of the plant. That's what distinguishes fruits from vegetables. And those fruits produce seeds. Now, fruit ripens and eventually falls off the tree. And the ripe fruit attracts animals that eat the fruit. They digest the fruit and pass the seeds through the digestive tract. Eventually, the seed comes out of the other end of the animal, as it were and is helpfully deposited in a pile of natural fertilizer, if you take our meaning. Now, fruits ripen in response to a chemical called ethylene. Nothing weird about that. But what is weird is that generally, when one fruit starts to ripen, others start to ripen. And when an individual fruit gets hurt, either by damage or by being eaten, other fruits start to ripen too. In ancient Egypt, farmers discovered that if they slashed a few figs on a fig tree, the rest of the figs on that tree and nearby trees would ripen faster. Why? Well, when a fruit is getting damaged, that either means something is around that considers the fruit good eating, or that the plant is in danger. Either way, it's a good time for the rest of the fruits and seeds to ripen and get off the plant and, hopefully, stuck into the ground. All of these various means of plant perception and communication along with many, many others, have given rise to a young and still somewhat controversial branch of biology, phytosemiotics, the study of plant communication. Now, fungi aren't plants, sure, but they do have a lot in common, phytosemiotics being one of them. Enough that we'll say, telepathy? Check. But what about zombification? Well, allow us to end this long discussion by introducing Ophiocordyceps Campanati balzani. The spores of this little fungus found in the Brazilian rainforest start by attaching to the top of an ant's head like a bulbous little black mushroom. 
As it matures, its tendrils dig through the ant's exoskeleton. Then the fungus starts releasing chemical enzymes into the ant that start to change its behavior. Convulsions force the ant to fall to the forest floor. The ant is induced to climb a suitable stem after it has fallen, and once it climbs to the right height, it digs its mandibles into the stem and won't let go. At that point, the fungus's little tendrils grow into the ant's brain, killing it. Then the fungus spreads over the ant's body, cementing it to the stem, where it feeds off the stem and the dead ant. When it matures, it releases spores into the air that eventually latch on to other ants and do the same thing. If you ever played Earthbound for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, you might remember that your character could get infected with a mushroom growing out of the top of their head that made movement erratic. That's a direct reference to the weird ant zombifying fungus in Brazil. Oh, did we mention that the zombie victims of the myconid spores in the Slave Lord's dungeon were described as having mushrooms growing out of their faces? What a weird coincidence, huh? We can tick that box. So in the end, despite all of their supernatural powers, the only thing truly unbelievable about these bizarre mushroom men from the 80s is that they were six feet tall and could walk. Everything else is totally believable. Be sure to tell your players. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. 